I was hiking in Colorado last week, and the Rocky Mountains aren't merely beautiful. They have the power to reset your perspective, to calm frayed nerves, to align your soul with the good and the true. Hiking in the mountains, it has a palpable moral and spiritual effect. I love it. Now the only downside is that someone from my generation, on the first day you're hiking in the mountains, I have to sing John Denver's Colorado Rocky Mountain High about 10 times. I've seen it rain and fire in the sky and that absurd silliness is suddenly, no not suddenly, over time, it's disabused by the beauty of the mountains and I fall into silence and the silence is golden. Oh, I must tell you about the pony beaver. Let, let me explain. One day I was hiking in the White River National Forest last week and it followed a cascading stream that was coming down the mountain. So at the beginning of the hike, it was a steep up. But at one point, I got up to a flatter place into a little clearing, the stream slowed down, and suddenly I saw something sitting on a log. And at first, I thought it was a bear. But very quickly, I noticed it was a huge beaver. Now, Rocky Mountain beavers can be 60 pounds and a yard long, but this beaver had to be 90 pounds and maybe a yard and a half. It was huge. And, well, that's why I've started calling it the pony beaver. It was as big as a pony. So I stood there and I took about 10 cell phone photos of it. Now, you know, I take a lot of photos with my cell phone. You see them from around the church and such. And so I'm pretty good with a cell phone. I took about 10 photos. Now at the end of the day, I was going back through my photos and there were none of that beaver. Now I know it was an operator error. I'm good with a cell phone. So I began to surmise it was an alien beaver from outer space that had power over my digital devices. Okay, maybe not. But this was the biggest beaver I've ever seen. Now, I know this sounds and looks like a fish story, but let's move now to another fish story. And if you took cell phone photos of Matthew 13, it, nothing would show up in terms of its spiritual and symbolic power, but it's packed with it. Let's go to Matthew 13, where Jesus tells a story on a lake. Now remember with me that he's standing in a boat, he's teaching to the crowds on the shore, and we've been going over these parables that he shares. He's been talking about yeast and a pearl and a mustard seed and a hidden treasure, but now he seizes the setting itself to empower the metaphor. He starts talking about dropping a net into the lake. Listen. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good fish into baskets, but threw out the bad. Let me now give this a symbolic interpretation. I worry that we're not so good anymore at symbolic interpretations of Scripture. Now mostly when we read the Bible, we either take it literally or we turn it into some easy moral or ethical point. But the language of religion is symbols. It's symbols that can point us to the depth of another dimension. Symbols are beyond rational and scientific types of language and they can capture the depths in a different way. 
Carl Jung spoke much about how symbols are the very language of the psyche. And if religion doesn't understand that it's trying to draw us into the depths of ourselves and that symbols are necessary, it turns religion into something thin and insipid. Religion, by its nature, speaks in symbols. So let's look at this symbolically. Carl Jung discovered that in dreams, a lake or a sea or an ocean becomes the primary symbol of the unconscious, your own depths. And so Jesus now is on a lake. He's talking about throwing a net into the lake. And Carl Jung also mentioned that fish in dreams become the symbol of the living material in one's own psyche, the depths of the unconscious that can come to the surface as thoughts emerge and surface or pre premonitions surface. And so here Jesus tells a story about a lake, your unconscious, about a net thrown into that the net being religion itself symbolically and how religion can bring forth your deepest aspects of your psyche, the fish. And then follow me symbolically. The fish are carefully separated into the good and the bad. And you know, my friend, that in the depth of our psyche, each one of us, we have good aspects and we have a shadow side bad aspects. Now, I know religion often talks about these failings within us as sin, but I want to turn down the volume because sin is talking about in such dramatic ways, and so often the church has used the word sin in abusive ways, called things a sin that aren't, and it, it all becomes just too hot. I, I just simply want to talk about the reality, and you know this, that there are parts of yourselves parts of yourself, all of us, that aren't so noble, that are more superficial, fearful, insecure, sideways. This story can remind us one of our tasks as a soul or psyche is to come to terms with those less noble aspects. For if you deny them and shove them aside, they'll have even more power over you. Denial is not just a river in Africa. Today it's a lake in Galilee, symbolically, and we must bring to the surface both the good and bad aspects. As an adult, as an adult, you calmly have to face your foibles. And you begin to learn to manage those. I'm speaking very simply. I'm not speaking theologically or even psychologically. You know this as an adult. You have to manage your weaknesses. You know, at times, I can become defensive. I've noticed this about myself. Either out of my insecurities or fear, I can overreact when I feel critiqued. It's not even attacked, really. If you just feel a little criticized, I become defensive. I think I've learned more and more as an adult. It never helps me or the situation to defend. Oh, we always want to defend. It doesn't help. I've been learning to essentially try to never defend. Even if I think I'm right on fact. <laughs> and this is hard. You want to bring all the facts to bear and show the person they're wrong and their critique of you. Defense doesn't do anybody any good, really. <laughs> so you as an adult are managing your weaknesses. Oh, this parable, it takes us into our own depths. But at the end of the parable, Jesus offers a sort of cosmic, more metaphysical, theological interpretation of the parable. Now, we don't know if this was actually Jesus himself because the gospel is being written a, a couple generations after Jesus. The gospel of Matthew in 85 AD and the gospel writers had a tendency to add these interpretations. So whether Jesus offered this in the boat or not that day, listen to how he ends with an interpretation. So it will be at the end of the age 
the angels will come out and separate the evil and the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so the historic church has taken that interpretation of this little parable about the fish to be symbolic of the the final reckoning, the judgment at the end of time where, where good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. That's how this parable's been read. I don't read it that way. I've said before that the concept of hell makes no theological sense to me whatsoever. And it hasn't to many great theologians down through the ages. Hell, the idea of eternal damnation, that doesn't square with a loving God, not eternal torture. Hell is a concept developed through the ages. The English word hell is not even in the Bible. Our, our notion of a eternal torture came from other cultural ideas like Hades and the Greek culture and such, not in the Bible. Eternal torture doesn't square with a God of love. But here's a surprising thing. I've come to find more value in the concept of purgatory. I think this parable might be speaking of purgatory. I know that sounds surprising. We think of that as an ancient concept, and Protestants tend to think that that's a very Roman Catholic notion from the Middle Ages. But purgatory is a theologically sublime notion that makes more and more sense to me. You see, even in Roman Catholic doctrine, it's not considered a place. In the 12th and 13th century, some Roman Catholic thinkers began to actually describe it as a place. But now an official Roman Catholic doctrine, and the popes are clear on this, purgatory is not a place. It's a process of inward spiritual transformation where you are made capable of God, capable of being in union with God. So purgatory is this, it's a refining fire metaphorically, but it's a place where the soul can evolve. Purgatory makes more and more sense to me. That we have aspects of ourselves that need refining. And that this process of being made capable of God. I like the idea of purgatory, that your soul is on a journey. I know that sounds strange to say, I like purgatory, but the idea that we have to keep evolving, becoming more pure, no longer thinking of places like eternal torture and hell, but purgatory is this process of becoming more whole and peaceful and holy, capable of God. Well, my friends, Jesus just told a little parable from a boat and somehow he has the ability to launch our minds into the depths of spiritual symbolism and theology with these simple stories. But may this story today make you take hold of your own depths as we walk together and become capable of God.